Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to do a review of the Aya Neo Air Pro. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did a review of the non pro Aya Neo Air. And in that first video, I went really into the weeds. In this one, I'm hoping to keep it short and sweet. And so today, we're going to just nitpick the things that separate the Pro from the non-Pro model. In particular, I'm interested in looking at the fit and finish, and we'll also look at some features like weight and ergonomics. And of course, we'll also take a look at performance when it comes to both PC gaming and retro game emulation. Now, the Aya Neo Air models are all being sold through the same Indiegogo page. And there's about a week left in the campaign, and then they'll fulfill all those orders, and then it'll eventually go to retail as well. Now the non-pro model starts at $500, and the price goes up from there depending on how much storage you want to add and if you want any sort of special colors. Now I personally already backed one of these myself, but I went with the lower end Aya Neo Air Pro. And it's this one here, it costs $650, and I mostly picked this one because it has a larger battery than the non-pro model. Now the one I'm reviewing today was sent over by Aya Neo, and it is the top of the line spec one here. This one came with 32 gigs of storage and a 2 terabyte hard drive. It also has an upgraded Ryzen 5825U chip. Now, in addition to being top of the line here, it's also very expensive. As you can see here, it's $1,255 right now. And considering the fact that the non-pro starts at $500 and goes up to $650 for the lower end pro model, my goal with this video here is to see whether or not that price difference is justified when it comes to the other factors. So go ahead and kick back, grab your favorite drink, and let's get started. Okay, as I mentioned in the introduction, I did a full in-depth review of the non-pro Air version. And so if you really want to get into the weeds about some of the capabilities of this product, I would look at that video first. In a nutshell, I was really impressed by the Aya Neo Air. The build quality is second to none, and they did a really great job with the buttons and ergonomics. I also really like the 5.5 inch OLED display, although I do feel it's a little bit small. My main negative concern with the Aya Neo Air was the battery life. And we'll talk about that more in detail in the context of the Pro later in this video. But for now, let's go over the hardware of the Ionia Pro model. First thing you're going to notice, this is the silver model. They call it a bright silver on their product page. And I think that's a pretty good description for the experience here. There's some sort of gloss covering over the entire device and it makes it super shiny. And while it's really impressive to look at, it is also a little bit smooth. In fact, I think it's more smooth than I would like. There were several times when I was playing this device and I thought, man, I better not drop this. And I think a lot of that had to do with just the kind of slickness of the device overall. On the top here, you can see there are no accented colors like the white model. It's just silver through and through. In terms of the buttons, everything's the same. The same hotkeys, analog sticks and triggers, and they all feel really good. These are some of the best made buttons and analog sticks that I've ever seen in a handheld. In terms of I.O. on the top, we have a power button that's also a fingerprint sensor, a volume rocker, and a USB Type-C port, and then finally an exhaust vent for the active cooling fan. Overall, the device is a little bit thicker in the middle than it was on the non-pro version, but the ergonomic grips were not scaled accordingly, so these are actually a little bit more shallow than on the other model. Now, one other thing about this particular glossy bright silver color is that it is a bit of a smudge magnet. The white model that I tested is a little bit more matte, and because of that, no fingerprints show up at all. So if that bothers you, that might be something to consider. On the bottom, we have dual stereo speakers, and then also a micro SD card slot for additional storage, and then a headphone jack and another USB type. C port. So now let's look at the front of the device. Now everything here is designed the same, but the coloring is different. In particular, the D-pad and the face buttons do not have those accented colors like they do on the white model. The analog sticks are the same as the other one. These are hall sensing analog sticks, and they have a nice grippiness around the edges of them. The D-pad still has that rubber membrane connection, feels really great. The select and start buttons also have a nice soft click to them. As far as face buttons, I really like these. They have a perfect amount of travel to them, although the buttons themselves are a little bit small. But honestly, after about a day of getting used to the button size, I didn't even notice it anymore. Right analog stick is the same as the left, super smooth. And then we have two function buttons on the bottom right. The one on the far right will reveal your desktop if you press on it, and then the left one will bring up Aya's software management app. Now in direct comparison of the two, you can see there's a stark difference in just the overall feel. The white one has a very clean look to it by virtue of having both white buttons and analog sticks. And all of these buttons and analog sticks feel exactly the same. They all have a matte kind of texture to them. Now this white model also has a matte feel to the device itself, which is in stark contrast to the bright silver slick kind of feel. I wouldn't say that either of them feel bad, but they feel completely different between the two. And I should mention, if you want to get the Pro model in white, that is available as well. Well, 
Now I also mentioned that the Pro model is a little bit thicker than the non-Pro model. If we do a measurement, you can see it's about 18 and a half millimeters for the non-Pro model and just about 22 millimeters for the Pro. Now when I'm switching between the two, I can definitely feel that the silver is more chunky than the other, but I think if you only had one, you wouldn't notice either way. Now, like I mentioned before, they did not elongate the grips in any way either. So they're the exact same size at the edge. It's just the centers that are thicker on the Pro models. And so what that means in the long run is that you will have a more grippy texture on the non-pro models than you will the pro. Now these are not like full grips like on the Steam Deck or the AOK Zoe A1, but they are still pretty prominent and feel really great, especially on the non-pro model. On the pro model, yes, you can tell that there are grips there, but they don't have that same kind of clutchy grippiness to them. In the end, what it means is that when you're actually playing, you will definitely feel that there are some grips there, but it won't ever get to the point where you feel like you're actually gripping on them. Instead, they're more like kind of suggestions for better ergonomics. So yes, at the end of the day, if grips and ergonomics are really important to you, the non-pro model is a little bit better in that regard. But I still think that both of these models are super nice to hold and feel really great. In terms of weight, the Pro model is 440 grams altogether. It's almost exactly 40 grams heavier than the non-Pro model. So really it's about a 10% weight difference between the two. Now these each have the same five and a half inch 1080p OLED panel, but what really separates the two colorways are the bezels. And while I do like the very clean nature of the white bezel on the white model, I feel like having a black bezel like on the bright silver model just makes the screen feel a little bit bigger. Obviously the viewing display is gonna be the same, but I don't know, just having those black borders around the side just kind of help to focus my eyes. And so between the two, I like the more prominent black bezels on the top model instead. Okay, now let's talk about battery life. For a baseline, let's look at the Aya Neo Air battery life again. You can see here, worst case scenario, I got about one hour and 16 minutes by playing Destiny 2 at a 12 watt TDP. Now you can crank that thermal profile a little bit higher. For example, the Aya Space software will allow you to go up to 15 watts and you can use third party apps to break it all the way up to 25. But personally, I found that anything past 12 just made the device too hot in my hands. And so my recommendation was to keep it at that baseline of 12 watts and then expect about an hour and 15 minutes altogether. Now by lowering that power profile, you can get better battery life. In fact, I got a little bit over three hours if I turned it down to five watts and then like turned off everything that was draining the battery. And so that's what you can expect from the non-pro Ioneo Air, which has a smaller battery than the pro model. Now we have two things going on with the Pro model that I tested here. Not only does it have a larger battery, but it also uses a different chip. And that chip will actually allow you to push it up to 18 watt TDP within the ISBA software. And I found that even at 18 watts, I was able to hold the device comfortably. It didn't get too hot. I think that mostly has to do with the increased physics of having a larger shell. Either way, with 18 watt TDP, I got about an hour and 10 minutes, which was very similar to what it was at 12 watts with the non-pro model. So essentially we'll get about the same amount of battery life between the two when pushed to the max, at least at that level of where I feel it's still comfortable to hold. Now I also performed some of those same tests that I did on the non-pro but on the pro and I found that across the board the battery life was better between the pro and the non-pro where it really seemed to shine was at the 8 watt TDP threshold. At this particular thermal profile I got well over two hours of battery life which was about 45% better than it was on the non-pro version. One thing to bear in mind as well because of that bigger battery it took about a half hour longer to charge this from 0 to 100 than it did on the non-pro model. So at the end of the day yes the bigger battery does mean you will have longer battery life but I'm not quite Quite convinced that this increased battery life is going to be worth the increased price. So what I want to do next is kind of talk a little bit about performance, but before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about sound. Now since making my Aya Neo Air review video, someone tipped me off to an app here called FX Sound. And this is a free and very lightweight app which will boost the sound quality of internal speakers. And I gotta say, it works wonders on both of these Aya Neo Air devices. Let's do a quick sound test. So yeah, as you can see, it is a night and day difference, and I highly encourage you to try this one out if you do happen to get one of these models. 
Okay, I'm gonna move into testing now. Now I'm gonna start with some of those mid-range and then higher end games. I'm not really gonna focus on the low end stuff. But I will say that some of the games that didn't run very well with a five watt TDP with the non-pro model work pretty well with the 5825U. For example, with Hades, you can get well over 40 frames per second, not quite 60, but if you set this to a frame limit of 40, you would probably have a pretty good time. Now, if you wanna get a 60 frame per second experience, then you will wanna upgrade the wattage to eight watts instead. And as we saw with this thermal profile, you should expect about two hours and maybe 15 minutes altogether. And I found that most of those moderate to lightweight games will play with an eight watt TDP really well. And so I would say if you're interested in playing indie PC titles, this might be a pretty good fit. The larger battery life will give you over two hours of gameplay and everything looks really nice on these OLED panels. And of course, depending on the game, you may not get a solid 60 frames per second, but you could always set a frame limit to maybe 40 or 30 frames, and then you can play from there. Either way, I think the combination of the power and battery life can give you a pretty good equilibrium. Now, when you start moving up to some of those more moderate systems, you may not get very good performance at 8 watts. For example, it's really hard for Bioshock Remastered to get anywhere above 30 frames per second. So this is one of those where you would either set it to 30 frames per second cap, or you can bump it up to the next level of 12 watt TDP and get really good frame rates instead. At a 12 watt TDP, you'll be able to play some of those older AAA PC titles and a lot of the more modern non AAA titles as well. In fact, with this particular chip, I found that when it came to just kind of having a nice performance balance, regardless of battery life, 12 watt TDP seemed to be the best. When it came to PC gaming, this ended up being my default TDP because most games worked fine and then if I needed to, I could boost it up a little bit. Now, in comparison between the original Aya Neo Air and this Pro model with the upgraded chip, you can definitely see a performance difference in games like Control. On the original Aya Neo Air, this one struggled to keep it around 30 frames per second. But with the upgraded chip, I got an average of about 50 frames per second, so that's a pretty big jump using the same amount of TDP. Now, another game that had a big performance jump between the two models is Destiny 2. This one got an average of about 40 frames per second at a 12 watt TDP, but with the upgraded chip, I got an average of about 45 and sometimes 50 frames per second. And while on paper, that doesn't sound like a big difference between the two, the playable experience was tangibly better on this pro model with the better chip. In fact, this was a joy to play. Now, like I mentioned, if you set the Aya Space app to pro mode and then press the Y button while you're in the app, you can adjust the TDP all the way to 18 watts. So that's what I've done here. And that's what I'm gonna use in some of those extreme cases. A good example here is Witcher 3. I got about 45 frames per second average Average when playing this at an 18 watt TDP. And to get the same amount of performance on the non-pro model, I had to boost it all the way up to 25 watts using a third party app. And not only that, when I set it to a 25 watt TDP on the other model, it got uncomfortably hot to hold. By contrast, the 18 watt TDP on the pro model here, it does get a little bit warm, but to me it wasn't a deal breaker. It was warm, but not hot. And as you can see, the temperature stayed around the low 70s. Okay, let's move on to retro game emulation. We're gonna start with PSP and work our way up. For PSP, I don't have a lot to say other than eight watt TDP is plenty of power to make all these games run at 4X resolution. That means it's gonna take full advantage of the wonderful 1080p OLED display and your PSP games have never looked better. And at this TDP, you can expect about two and a half hours of battery life. Now, moving up to GameCube, I found that most games played the best at a 12 watt TDP. And again, this is also upscaled to a 1080p resolution. But yeah, this is a more than capable GameCube machine. Now, for those really hard to play GameCube games, things like Rogue Squadron 2, it might be to your benefit to up it to an 18 watt TDP. That's gonna give you super smooth gameplay with no stutters at all. For example, let me move it back down to a 12 watt TDP and you'll see some of the stuttering here. And so yeah, it'll be up to you to choose between the stuttering that can happen at 12 watts or the lower battery life at 18. And across the board, it was the same story with PlayStation 2 emulation. Most games played at 12 watt TDP just fine, but if you did bump it up to 18 watts, you could get 1080p gameplay of games like God of War 2. Now, even then it wouldn't give you a full 60 frames per second when playing this game, but man, it was super close and it was a really nice gaming experience. Moving up to Wii U, it was actually a very similar story. So 12 watt TDP ran just fine for most every single game I threw at it. In fact, these games played so well that I thought, hey, let's try bumping it down to eight watts and see how it works. But as you can see here, eight watts is not quite enough for this system. And so yeah, a 12 watt TDP seems to be the best. 
In fact, Breath of the Wild plays pretty well at 12 watts. I would expect an average of about 35 frames per second, which is nice and smooth when playing this game. Of course, if you bump it up to 18 watts, it's going to get even better. In fact, it would often be in the mid to high 40s. And so yeah, if you want to have a really nice portable Wii U experience, then I would bump up this game to an 18 watt TDP. Just make sure you're close to a power brick when you do it. Okay, moving over to PS3, and you're going to be surprised to find it was the same story here. So 12 watt TDP for some of the lower end games worked just fine. Something like a PSN title, you know, Afterburner Climax, this works just great at 12 watts. And many retail games like Dead or Alive 5 were just wonderful at 12 watts as well. And so just based on my testing here, I would say a good third of PS3 games can play at a 12 watt TDP, which is going to give you a good hour and a half of battery life altogether. Now, if you want to play something a little bit more intense than that, something like Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty, you will want to bump it up to 18 watt TDP. And even then, you're not going to get 60 frames per second on this machine, but you are going to get a pretty smooth gameplay experience. And so I would say that at an 18 watt TDP, you can probably play the next third of games just fine. But if you're looking at that top third of PS3 emulated games, you're probably going to have struggles even at 18 watts. As you can see here with Devil May Cry, we're getting well under 30 frames per second. Okay, moving along to Nintendo Switch. Now this one was a little bit different. I just set this to 18 watts and then went from there. In general, I found that 2D and indie games would play at a 12 watt TDP, but everything else required 18. And even then at 18 watts, you're not gonna get full 60 frames per second experience. But in general, I found that all of these games were very much so playable. In fact, Link's Awakening, which is always a game I found really hard to emulate on Nintendo Switch, runs pretty dang well here. It will slow down every once in a while when something big happens on the screen, but otherwise it's actually a really smooth experience. And so I would say across the board, you will be able to emulate all the way through Nintendo Switch with relatively little issues other than the battery life. And I'm sure you might be thinking, well, why would you play Nintendo Switch on a handheld when Nintendo Switch is a handheld? Well, for me, it comes down to two things. Number one is overall comfort. The hall sensing analog triggers and sticks on this device are just a dream to play with. They make the overall experience just feel a lot more smooth. And on top of that, I really like the convenience of having all of my games on one device at a time. Yes, my Nintendo Switch can also play all of these games, but the iNeo Air Pro can play all of the other games as well. And so it's just nice to have everything in an all-in-one package. And when you combine this with a two terabyte hard drive, you can throw everything on here. It's pretty amazing. Now, one other thing I did is I tested the Bodicera custom Linux firmware on this device as well. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't get it working through the SD card slot. It would just boot into a black screen. But I was happy to find that if I used a flash drive, it booted up just fine. And I'm a big fan of using Bodicera as an emulation option on some of these handhelds. It gives it a really nice user interface, and then you can also have it on separate storage in case you want to just put PC games on the device itself. And there are a couple perks involved when using a Linux-based firmware like Botticera. In particular, I found when it comes to emulation that the Xbox emulator as well as 3DS do better on Linux than they do on Windows. And so if you want to play a lot of original Xbox titles or your favorite 3DS games, this might be a great option. And thankfully, the Botticera team is working on touchscreen implementation with their firmware. So in addition to being able to navigate the menus using the touchscreen, you'll also be able to use the touchscreen for 3DS, regular DS, as well as Wii U. Now, one unique thing about Botticera is that it doesn't have those customizable TDP controls like we do on the Windows side. And I'm not really sure what the default TDP is here. If I had to guess, it would be somewhere between 12 and 15 watts just based on the performance that I was seeing. And so yes, you will get performances a little bit worse than if you were to run an 18 watt TDP in Windows. But when it came to the majority of GameCube, PS2, as well as even Wii U titles, they still ran just fine. And so I would say if you want to have that Botticera experience, it's most definitely capable on this upgraded chip here on the Pro version. And I think in time, the iNeo Air, the non-Pro version, will work as well. It's just a matter of getting more devices into other people's hands so the community can kind of rally together and figure it all out. Either way, I think it's a great sign that Botticera is working on the iNeo Air Pro. Okay, so that's about all I really wanted to test and show when it came to this iNeo Air Pro model. At the end of the day, this is a really impressive device. In fact, it kind of feels like the device of my dream. If it had longer battery life and just a little bit bigger of a screen, I think this would have been a complete grand slam. But that being said, this does carry a very high price point, about $1,200 altogether. And as I showed earlier, you know, I bought the $650 Pro model that doesn't come with the upgraded CPU or added storage. And even though that device hasn't been delivered yet, I still think that one's going to be the Goldilocks device. Not only will it have the bigger battery and larger shell to make it not so hot when you're holding it, but at $650, that price is much more 
more reasonable than the $1200 plus dollars of this model. But if you're looking for the very best small handheld you can find right now, this is kind of it. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is the performance of this device enough to warrant that high price tag? At the end of the day, this isn't the most powerful handheld in the world, but the combination of size, really great controls, and OLED display do make it worth considering. I'm just not convinced that this Pro model is worth that higher price tag, and of course across the board, the battery life is the biggest detractor. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.